when you focus on the one thing, then the few things become clear. The one thing is Jesus Christ. I am convinced that if you will focus on Jesus Christ, he will show you what those few things are in life. Because there are a few things that are necessary in your life. And they are wrapped up in gold, silver, and precious stone. Everything else is wood, hay, and stubble. But you've got to get off the treadmill to figure out what the few things are. Give yourself the next 12 months to figure out what those few things are. But remember this. When you focus on everything, the few things then will become fuzzy. <laughs> but when you focus on the one thing, those few things will stay clear. And whatever those few things are, they'll be related to the one thing. Because when you focus on the one thing, it'll keep the few clear. It'll keep the few clear. Now, what I'm talking about, those few things, there, there will be some kingdom values in this new movement, this kingdom culture that Christ is, is wanting us to usher in. So somehow in this new movement, this radical new lifestyle that we're talking about, and you say, what does that mean, Terry? I'm not going to take the time this afternoon to go into that, but I am convinced of this, that if you focus on the one thing, he's going to show you. He's going to show you because he's the head of his church. He longs for that. You give him the time and he'll show you. He'll show you very clearly. When you focus on the one thing, then over the next year, those few things are going to come into focus. But somehow there'll be kingdom values related to this new movement, this kingdom culture we're talking about. And they'll somehow be directly related to the king. And when you focus on the king, the values will stay clear. And that's where the gold, silver, and precious stone is going to be found. Let me suggest an application. Two of them. The first one is focus on Jesus. Focus on knowing Him. Focus on your relationship with Him. As you focus on your relationship with Him, your relationship with others are going to change. Write this passage down. Write John 5, 39 and 40. Jesus tells the disciples, that you search the scriptures because you think that in here you have life. And he says, it's the scriptures that speak of me. It's in me that you have life. You see, beloved, if you, it, the objective, your primary objective is not to know the scriptures, it's to know him. Your primary objective is not to know the Bible. It's to know Him. Your primary objective is not to know the Word of God. It's to know the God of the Word. This is a means to an end. <laughs> I've got so much to learn. I am a baby in this new arena. I am, I am beginning all over. But it's a watershed for me in my Christian life. My relationship with Jesus. The last four or five years for me have been... 180 degrees removed than the earlier years of my Christian life. I'm learning what it means to have friends. Christians and non-Christians. One of my closest friends is a non-Christian today. He's close. I have mixed feelings now. I just, it's so fun having a non-Christian friend and I have to start all over when, I, when, he, when he becomes a Christian. But he's close. I'm learning a lot. He's the beer distributor for a four-state area in Colorado. Lives two doors down from me. What a fun-loving, joyful guy. Focus on knowing him. One of the things that started this for me was my trip to Brazil. It was um, all part of a two- or three-year process God had in store for him. But after spending a month there, this dentist took me for a walk one night. And uh, he put his arm around me and he said, Terry, he said, uh, you folks in America are sure very, you're, you're very task oriented, aren't you? I said, yeah, we really are. We're really committed to the Great Commission. We've, uh, we give it all we got. And uh, he said, well, we Latins are very relationship oriented. And then he squeezed my shoulder and he said, guess which came first in the Christian faith?
I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten that. The great commandment precedes the great commission, doesn't it? Yeah. A friend of mine, some of you know Fernando, he was, um, he's Latin, but he was, came to Christ in the United States and was discipled there by the navigators and uh, got his engineering degree. And then he went back to one of these Latin American countries. For the last eight years, he's been there. Well, let me tell you, these Latins get together for two hours every morning before they go to work. And uh, you think, man, what do they do? Well, for, they just get together. They just get together, you know, drink coffee, and enjoy one another, and pray, and share what's on their heart for one another, and share their lives and their families, care for one another, cry, exhort one another. And old Fernando, he's a task-oriented dude, boy. I tell you, we built into him real good. And um, he said, you know, for eight years, I was frustrated every morning. I thought, if they had all, just think what all they could get done. If they prayed for 15 minutes, then went on in, they get another hour and 45 minutes, and you get all these things done. They never come to the meeting with an agenda. <laughs> you just, they, uh, they just, you know, and so for eight years, he was frustrated. And he said, you know, it was this year. God opened my mind and my heart and I realized that the objective was just to be together. There was no other objective. That was the objective. Whew, I stripped every circuit and I have. All my gears got ripped apart just to be together. That was objective enough. Now, non-Christians can't handle that. The greatest offensive weapon the world ever known is has ever known is love. How do you mo how do you communicate that? Amazing. The supreme purpose in life is knowing Christ. Jesus put it this way in Mark twelve, thirty and thirty one Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is this, I shall love thy neighbor as thyself. And there's no other commandment greater than these. And then some dude came along and said, well, uh, who is my neighbor? And you know the story of the Good Samaritan. Your neighbor is anyone in need. Oh. Christian and non-Christian alike. Yeah. Let me suggest an application on this first one that you focus on Jesus. One of the things I've been doing for the last three, three and a half years now, to focus on Jesus, I get up and I read one chapter in the Gospels every day just to focus on Jesus. And I meditate on Jesus. Think about Him. Why did He ask that question? Or uh, what can I learn about Him? Or what's the Lord saying to me? In the four Gospels, there are 89 chapters. That means you can go through the Gospels four times a year and have nine days that you can sleep in and relax and blow it and all that stuff. But I am convinced, one of the things I do when I travel around and look at staff, when I find them hooked into Jesus and focused on Him, then man, my cares, and I could care less. He's the head of the church. He's going to show them. They don't need my help. I'll just encourage them and enjoy them. But when I catch a staff on the treadmill caught up in the parade I get concerned because the work's going to falter and I get concerned about the direction that it may or may not be going if you're hooked into Jesus he's the head of his church I trust you with it man alive if you're not hooked in then I'm going to be concerned but that's why I can share these things and then leave you if you'll hook into Jesus, he'll lead you. He'll tell you about this new culture and this new movement. He'll encourage you to get together. He'll encourage you to figure these things out. And you'll do it. You'll figure it out. He'll bless your heart and change your life. And he'll make life fun and joy. And you can get off that treadmill. I don't know all that that'll mean. But I know he'll show you and you can figure it out. It's a radical new lifestyle that we're talking about. One that people are going to be climbing the fence to figure out what you got that they hadn't. 
the second application. You're going to need to identify and clarify those few things. Take the next 12 months to do that. Those of you that are going to do that, talk about that and, and share what you're learning. Uh, I've found that there are three things. I may have a fourth, and I've been thinking about a fifth, but I've narrowed them down. And I could tell you what they are, but I'm not. But it's taken me a year. And you know, I, I just put a page in my journal that I keep and record what I'm learning about Jesus each day. And I put a page in there, and I ended up with 37 things that are absolutely strategic and essential on these few things. And then I forgot he did say few. So somehow we need to sort that out. But, but if you're hooked into him, it's a few things. Remember that, a few, a few things. Figure out what those are. And then remember this, when you focus on the one thing in life, the few things will stay clear and you can give yourself to the gold, silver, and precious stone. You can go home accomplishing your mission and you can hear Jesus tell you, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Wow. You accomplished your destiny. But I want you to remember that you've got to have a sharp, clear focus. And you must focus on the one thing in order to keep the few things clear. And you need to take some time to identify what those few things are. Remember this. Simplicity is the secret to seeing things clearly. It's not simple. Forget it. The Lord hadn't got his hand on it. If it gets complicated, I ask him, some of my brothers here, I said, has the disciple-making ministry gotten complex and heavy? Oh, man. You know, uh, I couldn't be a disciple today, I don't, I don't think. I went through an area and saw what a person had to do to become a disciple in this particular area, and I thought, man, I'd flunk that. It's got to be simple. Let me give you a great verse. 2 Corinthians 11.3. It's the verse that led me into all this in the first place. 2 Corinthians 11.3. Paul said, I am afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, that your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. I love it simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Beloved, there are three ways that you can waste your life. You can do nothing, you can do the wrong thing, or you can do so many things that everything you do counts for nothing. Don't get caught up in the parade. Let me give you a story about Father James Fox. He's a Catholic priest that died this year. Uh, recently, a friend of mine told me this story. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. He was 82 years old, and he died uh, this year, on this past year on Good Friday. He, um, he entered the, uh, the community of Gethsemane in January of 1927 after graduating from Harvard at the age of 22. He spent the next 60 years of his life in this um, environment, eight hours on his knees every day in prayer for 60 years. Well, this guy was called to his bedside before he died, and he says, I got one question for you. Tell me after 60 years what you feel is the most important thing that you've learned in all that prayer. And here's what he said. He said, well, it has to do with the goal, the target, the bullseye, the objective that we should be aiming at. He says, on a rifle range, if you ever hope to hit the target, you must at least see the target in order to keep your eye on it. Maybe if you do not see it, you may not even hit it, but you sure will never hit it if you do not keep your eye on it. What is the target, he asked? What is the bullseye at which you're aiming? Some may say to themselves, oh, I must be more humble. Or others will say, I must be more patient, or I must be kinder, charitable, or forgiving. But do you see that in every one of these aims, 
that the subject of each sentence is the capital I. And is not he the I, the very fellow that you should be trying to forget as enemy number one? Or one may say, I must strive for perfection. Or is not the goal of the faithful the keeping of the rules, the guidelines? Or is not the goal to grow in virtue? Indeed, all of these have their place and are necessary, but they're not ultimate. But most important, all of these goals are impersonal. For example, you're never going to say hello to patience. You'll never shake hands with humility. You'll never say hi to charity. They're all abstractions. Whereas life is not something, it's someone. That someone, that person, is Jesus the Christ. Yes, Jesus is the target. He's the objective. The secret of success in your life. And he went on to say there are two rules in life. Life is very simple. The first rule is this. Do what will please Jesus. The second rule is this. Avoid whatever will displease Jesus. Some day, he said, some hour, some second, you will close your eyes on everything, on everyone in this world, and open them up in eternity. Who will you see? Will it not be Jesus? Then will you not be glad that you gave up everything for him and never took it back? I think he had the focus. What a story. Because of the time, I'm going to move through very rapidly on uh, the second two principles. That's just the first one. But if you keep hold of that, I can leave here with great joy in my heart. And some of you will, and I'm encouraged for that. The second guiding passage and principle for those that would become part of this worldwide disciple-making movement can be summed up in one verse and in one word. The verse is John 1.14, and the word is modeling. M-O-D-E-L-I-N-G. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Let me suggest to you that when we think about the second principle, I want to leave you with four characteristics from this passage and with this principle of modeling. And here's the first characteristic. The Word became flesh. You say, oh, that's sort of simple. Yeah, but it's because it's simple that that's why it's so profound. And if God thought that as God, I can communicate any way I want to, but He chose to do it this way, the Word, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word left heaven and became flesh and dwelt among us. The first cardinal characteristic to this profound principle is that the Word has got to become flesh in your life. The written Word must become the living Word in your life. You must reassess radically, be honest, Go at this again and tremble at God's word when he says something. Do what it says. Focus on Jesus and become like him. He's the model. Let the word become flesh in your life. That's the objective. Romans 8.28 We're to be conformed into his image. And when the word becomes flesh and you do what it says, you become like a christ Chan. You become his arms and his legs and his feet and his mouth and his voice and you're able to reach out and touch somebody and love somebody and care for them. Do you know one of the things that I discovered on the living word? I discovered that the word only has life as it touches somebody else. You want the living word? It'll either touch God or it'll touch horizontally and touch man. 
somehow the living word gets life when it reaches out and touches somebody else. The word has got to become flesh. This is key to this radical new way of living and thinking. This is the key to confronting society with a new way of life. See, our philosophy of Christian education is to affect the mind. God wants to affect the heart. When you affect the heart, the word becomes flesh. It's lived out in my life. I like Isaiah 66 too. But to this one I will look. You want God to look to you to be one of his men and his women? But to this one, God says, I will look. To him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. A disciple, the Greek word for disciple, is a learner. I asked nine seminary professors this year, I says, what's, a, what's the Greek word for disciple? They told me, I says, what does it mean? He's a learner. Describe a learner. Well, when they finished describing it, his head was full. But as I understand that word learner, it means thought accompanied by endeavor. If you're going to be his disciple, the word's got to become flesh. It's got to get from the head to your heart. The second cardinal principle, characteristic of this principle. And I, I'm going to, you're familiar with what a grenade is. I'm going to pass the grenades out and I've pulled the pen and I'm going to leave one with you now. Now you understand that I, I don't know all that this means, but I do know that if you'll follow the first principle, you'll figure it out. But now here's the kicker. In order to model this life in a redemptive way, the first one is that you have got to have the word become flesh. And the second one is you've got to go out and dwell among them. You've got to dwell among them. Now, you do this at work. But you've got to do it not only where you work, but where you live and where you play. You've got to do it in all three. Because life makes up all three. And to not do that is to not see all that the Christian life is meant to be. And you say, well, how in the world do you do that? I don't know. But I'm working on it. I've got some things that I'm doing, that we're doing in the U.S., that are radically different. And I know this. You've got to ask yourself, you know, in, in the U.S. we work 50 hours a week. And then we come home and, <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, you do your honeydew list on uh, Saturday afternoon after 2. And then you finally get that honeydew list done. And then we got to fire up the grill because we got friends coming over. And uh, we fire the grill up and then uh, everybody in the neighborhood has their grills going. And then finally about midnight you shut down for the week. And then Sunday morning we get in our car and head off to church waving at everybody as we go by. And uh, praise the Lord and uh, glory. And uh, somehow we're not dwelling among them at a time that's very, very key. Probably the only time in the week that they're relaxed and they have a chance to be lived before you. And where am I? Well, I'm not dwelling among them. Now that sounds almost like a heretic. But I'm working, uh, I'm a churchman. Became a Christian in the church, discipled in the church, and discipled in the church. But I know this, that Jesus Christ came not for the healthy, he came for those that were sick. He did not come to seek and to save the saved. It was the lost that he came for. And the way he chose to do it was he came and he dwelt among them. Now, I don't know all that that means, and there's some enormous implications. And here's what, I, here's what I'm not saying, by the way. I am not saying, stop going to church. Let me make that very clear. You say, well, how are you going to do it? I don't know, but you're going to have to figure it out. But when I sit with 300 pastors, 
I share this. And basically our form today, our religious forms, are militating against accomplishing the very thing that we formed. Something, somewhere that's not right. And so as we sit and talk, I'm with them. They're with me. That's the fact. That's the issue today. And the question is, how do we resolve it? Well, there's some creative things going on. First of all, a particular church where I go, I teach Sunday school when I'm in town. I co-teach so that when I'm not in town, the, somebody else can. And, uh, but when I'm in town, for the last 18 months, I've been teaching a Sunday school, taking people through this concept of the kingdom culture taking them through three different books of the Bible that help understand what's happening and that uh, approach the principles of change. And uh, we've got a large Sunday school class with a lot of couples in it now that these laymen are beginning to see the issue, their husbands and wives. And we're talking about all of us being missionaries from the church to society in Colorado Springs. Now that's radical stuff. All of us are missionaries. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, maybe we can get together um, on Thursday nights. Maybe we could get together one Thursday night a month. Maybe we could get together a couple of Thursday nights a month and all praise God and worship together and share with others what's going on and what God's doing and what we're learning. Have communion together and fellowship in the Lord. Then on Sunday, we'll be dwelling among them. That's just one way to do it there there's got to be many but I know this that when God went to communicate all I know is he came the word became flesh and secondly they dwelt among them I, I do know that is true and I do know that the religious people that were sold and hooked into the forms gave him the hardest time I am not saying again that we should abolish the church. You are the church. You have got to figure that out. But here's what I am convinced of. If you'll follow the first principle, don't rip the fabric apart for this new wineskin that we're talking about. Move slowly. Think it through. Present the issue with uh, the leadership in the church. And, and let's resolve it together. That's what I'm saying. The third principle is that they beheld his glory. Beloved, our motivation must be to glorify God. God is going to always work in such a way that he gets the credit for it. That's why I like the Westminster Confession. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. I like that. That's what John 5.16 is about. Let your light so shine, shine in such a way before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Not lift you up and say, what a fine person you are. You have really got it together. John chapter 16 gives a great dissertation, the Lord does, on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And in chapter 16, verse 14, it gives the ministry of the Holy Spirit in, in one dimension of it. He will glorify me, Jesus says. He doesn't come to glorify himself. The Spirit that's within you comes to glorify Jesus. Christ, and the reason for that is, when you point to Christ, Christ is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. The Spirit is designed to point to the way. The last cardinal characteristic. That's how we dwell among them. Full of grace and full of truth. Not works, but grace. It tells how we're to dwell among them. I agreed through the Gospels and I never see Jesus running through Jerusalem and jogging through Judea and roaring through Samaria. Somehow I don't capture what he was doing on the treadmill. Are we going to have the courage to look at Jesus and contextualize the message?
The third and last principle that I'd like to leave with you The third and last principle, and because of the time, I'll just cover it real quickly and call it quit. But it's perhaps the most one of the one of the most three important principles I know of. Um, and here it is: for those that are going to be part of this worldwide disciple-making movement, this third principle deals with the foundational virtue and value that must become the motivation for all that we do. It must become the sole motivation behind both of our commitment to the person of Christ and the work of Christ. The passage, there are several, but I'll leave one with you. The passage is John 13, 34, and 35. You know it. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Do you know why it's a new commandment? He said that before the Old Testament. That's nothing new about that. What was new about it? Here's what's new about it. As I have loved you, he modeled it. That's what's new. Love got feet and arms. That's what was new, was he modeled it. The principle is simply love one another in the same way that Jesus loved you. The impact, all mankind, all of society will know that we are his disciples by this radical new movement, this new thinking, this new lifestyle. For God so loved the world that he gave. The essence of love is giving. The essence of lust is getting. As an ambassador, I'd like to recruit you this afternoon to this army. To this worldwide disciple-making movement. Day by day, men came to help until there was a great army like the army of God. I pray that these words of mine, which I every day make supplication before the Lord, may be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he might maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people, as each day requires, so that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God, there's no one else. Let your heart, therefore, be holy devoted to the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments as at this day. It will require a threefold commitment. If you're going to join this army, the first commitment is to Christ and the principle of Luke 10, 38 through 40. The second commitment is to community. John 13, 34 and 35. It'll be absolutely foundational to pull it off. The one and others of scripture. The third commitment is to commission. The vision, the cause. John 1, 14. Four cardinal characteristics. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this would not just be another time together, another conference, another message, another, some words shared. Oh, dear God, I pray that all the power in heaven and earth will grip our hearts and would have the courage to step aside and to reflect and think, to work over the things that we've been together talking about. They're so significant for all eternity. I pray that this beloved bunch of brothers and sisters that I'll be with forever, for all eternity. I pray that you'd give them the courage to assess and refocus and rethink. The courage to say yes to all that it means and the courage and the wisdom to follow these three principles. 
So Lord, I thank you for the great privilege, not one that is that far down the pike, but one, Lord, that uh, along with my brothers and sisters that uh, continues to beg for food. And so, Lord, I uh, lay myself and these brothers and sisters and ask that you would lead us, give us wisdom and discernment, courage to be the people that you want us to be, to capture our destiny for this hour. We commit it to you now in the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus the Christ. Amen.